We start with two questions. The first question is, are all lawful acts moral? So you are asked to think of examples, if you can, of something that is allowed by law and yet seems wrong to you. The second question is, are all moral acts lawful? So you are asked to think of an example or examples of something that has occurred in history or in the present time that somebody has done that seems right, maybe even courageous or virtuous, and yet puts them in legal jeopardy because they violated a law. I would encourage all of you to reflect upon these two questions because I'm sure if you do, you can come up with many examples to answer the question no. For purposes of today, to push our learning forward, I'm going to give two. To answer the first question, I would refer to the Holocaust. The Holocaust was completely lawful under the laws of Nazi Germany, from the confiscation of people's property, to sending them to labor camps, to sending them to their death in the gas chambers, to doing human experimentation on people, treating them like laboratory rats. Everything in Germany was done with proper rec record keeping and in accordance with their legal procedures. Those records still exist. So clearly, not all lawful acts are moral. Conversely, the people who gave sanctuary to Jewish children, like Anne Frank, were acting in violation of law. I think we could agree that they were acting honorably to open up their home and find a place where they could hide children, innocent children, from being killed. On a larger scale, and throughout Europe, many good and decent people did that. They violated law to save the lives of innocent children but they were violating law. On a larger scale, we could look to Oskar Schindler, who used his role as an industrialist to save thousands of people from wrongful death. It's interesting to note that he faced multiple arrests in Germany for his actions. And so we can summarize our answer to those two questions through looking at the relationship between law and ethics as being illustrated by a Venn diagram. We have lawful acts, in one circle and moral acts in another circle. And they intersect, but they are not congruent because our ability to answer those two questions no enables us to see that they're not the same thing. Now, of course, in the freest countries in the world, people respect the law. It reflects their ideal of justice and right and wrong. And in those countries, the overlap between law and morality is great. In other countries in the world, the least free countries in the world, the overlap is minimal, if at all. These are countries where law just becomes an instrumentality of power and has no moral force behind it. In free countries, people obey the law because they respect it. In unfree countries, people obey the law because they're afraid of punishment. So clearly we can agree that amoral law is a menace or a threat to human liberty, security, and peace. Amoral means divorced from morality, not concerned with morality. And it simply becomes an instrument for people in power to use towards whatever ends. For example, the Holocaust. For example, slavery. So given that laws are often unjust in history and in the present times, we can note that our moral heroes are often people who have violated law people who have committed civil disobedience, people who have been diso dissidents under authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. From history, we can look to Socrates and Antigone. More recently, we can look to Mohandas Gandhi, we can look to Martin Luther King, we can look to Rosa Parks, we can look to Harriet Tubman, we can look to Muhammad Ali, we can look to Václav Havel, and all the people who lived under communism and had the courage to resist the rules of the state. The rule of law principles are aimed at aligning law and ethics to the extent possible. They can never be exactly the same because law is uniform for everybody in society and ethics will be more personal. Nonetheless, the rule of law principles grew out of the history of monarchy where we learned that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so what we got was a number of things in the development of constitutional law and constitutional republicanism that are meant to separate out power and its corrupting influences. Separation of powers, 
checks and balances, oversight, and importantly, an independent judiciary, a presumption of innocence, and procedural protections that prevent people from being wrongfully convicted and locked away because they happen to be political enemies of the state. So the rule of law principles are wonderful. They teach the lessons of history. However, the problem is that they're subject to criticism because those who preach law, rule of law principles often do not practice what they preach. For example, a couple of additional rule of law principles are transparency and accountability. Transparency means that the public has access to see what's happening in their name because government is supposed to be of, by, and for the people. So there's laws that give them access to information. Nonetheless, the prerogatives of power in the real world make governments lean upon executive privilege and secrecy in order to deny people access to that information. Another rule of law principle is accountability. It's the notion of equal justice under the law. Blind justice, everybody is treated equally, no matter how powerful or how unpowerful, no matter how rich or how poor. Everybody talks that talk, but if we look at the real world today and we think about the impunity of torturers and people who cause the financial crisis, committing fi criminal financial fraud, and the lack of accountability, it shows this discrepancy. The initial part of my proposal today is to suggest to you that procedure is what we must look to in order to unify the legitimacy of the law. Procedure is that which enables equality of application of the law. Lon Fuller was a scholar who wrote a book that I have right here called The Morality of the Law. And his reasoning was that law becomes law because of the procedural fairness of it. Absent procedural fairness, it doesn't really qualify as law. So commenting on the law of Nazi Germany, Lon Fuller said, that is not law because the laws in Nazi Germany were made in secret and they were applied retroactively, meaning going back in time. That is obviously unfair because if you're taking conduct that wasn't unlawful at the time and people didn't know it, and then subsequently passing laws punishing for them, that is wrong. And so Lon Fuller looking at Nazi law says that's not legitimate law. We need to look to fair process in order to create legitimate law. Ronald Dworkin is a scholar who focused his work in his books, Law's Empire, and Taking Rights Seriously, among his other books, on looking at how judges make law under the common law tradition. He said that judges have an obligation and a responsibility to be honest in their reasoning process, not to use precedent for results-oriented opinions, but rather to honestly address the difficult issues that judges confront in finding out what is the right legal decision here, because this is what enables the further progress of the common law to have an honest discussion about the weighing and balance that's often involved in judicial opinions. So we look to process to legitimize the law. Now we turn our attention to international law. Obviously, as you all know, international law is needed in order to address the 21st century challenges that we confront as global citizens. Global warming, public health challenges, pandemics, mass migration challenges, other public health challenges caused by food safety traveling across borders, war, militarism, terrorism, tax evasion, and the list goes on. These challenges can't be met by state law. So we turn to the roots of international law in order to understand why we need to develop better procedures to empower it. The roots of international law start with Aristotle. Aristotle was the first person to draw the distinction between natural law and positive law. And international law is deemed on resting upon universal principles of right and wrong. You're all familiar with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Aristotle said that natural law is that which applies to all people at all times because it rests upon the universal principles of morality. 
He distinguished that from positive law. Positive law is law that is functional law, man-made law made by a particular society at a particular time to serve its functional needs. So maybe not taking an innocent life would be an example of natural law, and maybe the tax code would be an example of positive law. Cicero, the Roman jurist, said that natural law is the only valid law. Legal scholars refer to natural law oftentimes as higher law and positive law as lesser law. The problem with international law, frankly, even though it has these grand concepts, is double standards. So I want to follow up on Nazi law and the Nuremberg principles and apply double standards to the International Criminal Court briefly. The Nuremberg principles were the first effort to apply universal standards of national law in such a way that they would be enforced upon people. So long as an individual can, has, a, has a moral choice to be able to tell that what they're doing is wrong, they will be punished for it even if it didn't conflict with the positive law of the state that they lived in, because these are deemed crime, crimes against humanity. Wars against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity are constituted under that. We had a series of special courts set up in places like Rwanda and Sierra Leone and Yugoslavia in order to apply these standards to the worst atrocities happening in the world. Finally, as a result of the 1998 Rome Statute in 2002, the International Criminal Court began its work. The problem is that the most powerful states of the world did not consent to its jurisdiction. And so in its 13 years of existence, we've seen predominantly African leaders tried by the International Criminal Court. Something with a great idea has had its legitimacy undermined because powerful states have not consented to its jurisdiction. And so we turn to Immanuel Kant for a fix to this. Immanuel Kant's moral reasoning theory is most notably for his categorical imperative. Kant said that I can never apply a rule to my own conduct, which I wouldn't also apply to all other people. I like to think of Kant's categorical imperative as the law of universalizability because it's twofold. It implies that you cannot apply a standard to your own conduct, which you wouldn't apply to all others, and it also implies that you cannot impose a standard upon others that you would not also apply to yourself. And so the powerful countries not consenting to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court clearly violates this. Okay, so Kant said something essentially um, he said, the world has entered into a relationship, the, the international community, where a violation of rights in one part of the world is a threat to security and peace everywhere in the world. That he was writing in 1795 in his book, Perpetual Peace. Here in 2015, we can see that that is more true than ever, as our world has become well more interconnected. Martin Luther King put it this way, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and therefore an individual has a moral obligation to disobey an unjust law. The chief justice of the, um, the, the chief prosecutor of the Nuremberg war uh, crimes trials, Robert Jackson, articulated Kant's categorical imperative as follows. He said, the record upon which we judge the defendants that were trying of uh, Nazi Germany for their conduct is the same record upon which history will judge us. For if we put to their lips a poisoned chalice, which is a cup to drink from, which is a metaphor for an unfair process, then that we are also putting that chalice to our own lips and drinking the poison an application of Kant's categorical imperative. So we need to do better, and I want to turn our attention in the time that's left to the work we can do in order to make this proposal a reality. 
I know many people sitting here today are probably thinking, this is a pipe dream. The real world we live in, we can never apply these standards to lawmaking because law is a mere exertion of power. I want to suggest to you that that's not necessarily the case, both through history and what is happening right now. The scholars that I note on the handout that you have and that what is on the screen for you viewers uh, are people that we should refer to to guide us in our efforts to create principled law to safeguard our future. I just want to mention one of them, William Urey. William Urey was the co-founder of the Harvard Project on Negotiation and the co-author of the book Getting to Yes, which has affected negotiations in business, in interpersonal relationships, and also in international diplomacy. I refer you to, to his work in this respect and note that he was involved in drafting in the negotiation of international treaties, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas. And the Montreal Protocol is the example I want to offer you. His main contribution is we need to focus on interests rather than positions. Positions is what we want. Interests is what we can achieve that serves the common good as well as our own good. That's an overriding principle we need to be mindful of in lawmaking. The Montreal Protocol was ratified in 1987, and it's an example of uh, the way in which international law can work if the process is fair. The Montreal Protocol dealt with a problem where our ozone layer was being depleted. And by bringing together stakeholders in the international community to problem solve, the process was such that everybody was consulted during the early deliberations such that nobody was presented with something to sign on to without having to have, have a role in its creation. Too often in international law and politics, powerful members of the community prepare a treaty or a convention and then demand that weaker countries sign on to it. We saw that at the Copenhagen Climate Conference not too long ago. Hopefully we'll do better in Paris in the coming weeks. Because of the inclusive, deliberative way in which the Montreal Protocol was developed, it worked. We figured out solutions. We got rid of aerosol sprays. We found other ways to deliver these products that people use that did not emit chlorofluorocarbons. And that enabled the ozone layer to be protected. And what's happened over the past 25, to help me do my math, 28 years, is that the ozone layer has been healing itself, showing us the wonderful regenerative powers of nature if we respect nature. I think we should look to the VW uh, scandal that's going on now as a real wake-up call. I think if we take a look at what has happened with Volkswagen and the regulatory regime to protect clean air, we have to acknowledge that the way that we're working at business as usual must stop. And it starts with education. We're here at a university. We need to stop treating ethics as something that can only be justified for economic reasons. We can no longer afford to subordinate non-economic values to economic values. And we need to look at the way we teach professions. Do we really want lawyers writing torture memos to justify torture? Do we really want psychologists and doctors helping to administer torture? Do we really want accountants to be acting as auditors and consultants at the same time and therefore not doing their job properly? Do we really want tax advisors helping their clients to commit tax evasion? Do we really want our financial institutions, whether it's the investment banks or the credit rating agencies, having a business model of perpetuating fraud upon consumers? No. And the point is, the way in which we teach these professions needs to emphasize that these professions have intrinsic value. They are not just instruments to be used for whatever means the client may desire. In other words, these professions should act as professional advisors, not hired guns, because they do have intrinsic value and they must emphasize principle over cynicism. This is a pragmatic proposal, not an idealistic one. A sober-eyed look at what's going on in the world shows us that we need to change course. If you think that the 
refugee crisis, as it's being called in Europe right now, is severe, if we don't change course, this is going to be extremely minor compared to what we're looking at. With rising seas, growing warfare and desperation, this is going to be small potatoes. We can do it by focusing on interests rather than positions. We all will recognize, looking at the refugee crisis, that of course building fences and walls doesn't offer a solution. We know that education, negotiation, and compromise is part of what we need to do to address the root causes of human desperation in the world today that causes people to flee their homeland. We can look to the Montreal Protocol as an example of what we can achieve when we put our interests over the positions we may have. Because we can all agree that the blood that unites us as human beings in the world is still thicker than the waters that divide us. And if we look at what's happened just in the past two days, we can get further encouragement. Your voice can be heard. Yes, old ways die hard. Yes, power concedes nothing without a demand. But there are so many ways in which decent, compassionate people can work together to have their voices heard today. And as encouragement, I just want to look at what's happened in the past two days. This is November 7th. On November 5th, a criminal investigation was launched against ExxonMobil for lying to the public and investors about its knowledge of the relationship between its fossil fuel practices and global warming. Legal scholars say this is going to be precedent for criminal investigations into other fossil fuel companies who may have engaged in similar deceit. This is brought by the New York Attorney General. And then yesterday, November 6th, President Obama announced that he will not approve the pipeline to bring uh, energy from the Keystone oil pipeline that was to bring dirty fossil fuel energy from Canada to the United States. And interestingly, he was very clear in his announcement of this that the reason he was doing it was because this is a dirty energy source and the security of the people is better served by what we've been doing to develop alternative energy sources and that this would exacerbate the problem of global warming. This is the first time ever, I believe, that a head of state has denied approval of a construction or development program for his state with the primary reason being its impact on the climate. That's our voices being heard. There was huge civil society mobilization by concerned people and environmentalists that's been going on for a number of years now that achieved something yesterday. This project will not proceed. And so Obama says he's going to be going to the Paris Climate Conference with an agenda of making the world take our obvious shared interests in protecting the natural resources we depend upon for our survival to be addressed seriously. Long overdue, we shall see. Let's keep using our voices to make sure that that is actually accomplished. And so in closing, what I want to say to you is, your voices matter. If you care about safeguarding our future, there's reason for encouragement. We have much work to do. Thank you.